you're a foreigner in that we're not a research organisation. We actually suppose sit at both the beginning and the end in that we're the data providers um, for infrastructure and for a lot of community data. So the local government is probably providing something like 50% of that data to you and we're a fairly major provider. However, there are 79 of us and we all do it differently in Victoria. Um, I can guarantee that. And even within a, a council, if you come back six months later, I'll give you in a different form than you got it six months earlier. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's how we sit. But also, we're at the end. end. So if, you got, if this research is actually to make a difference to the community, then to a large extent, it's little government is <coughs> going to do that implementation and the state government, but, but for a large things, but walkability in particular, we're going to be doing that. So we take this on board a little bit seriously to try and get some sort of, what does it mean to get a collective view from the sector? Can we, can we actually operate as a sector to do this? So we, we started this by workshop, and we were a bit blown over, because normally at a workshop when we do something like this, we can't get 14 people there. We had over 50 people turn up to this workshop, um, which indicates that walkability is something that is really um, on, on the edge there. People are really interested, and it's something that caught the imagination. Um, do I just press? The other button. The other button. Um, that one. There. Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, the objectives of the workshop. Why is it important? We showed a video. We had to talk through people through there. We looked at the issues and facing and the challenges facing walkability. We looked at the outcomes that need to be achieved if we're <coughs> going to address the problems that walkability is addressing. So, how how much walkability do we need to actually achieve? Um, the strategic options to, to do that, uh, and the actions that we need to be able to sort of put those things in place, uh, all, all of this in one day. Uh, so we got a whole lot of reasons why strategic comments, but the one I'm just going to focus on, probably captures it all there, is the lack of strategic com commitment in many councils limits their ability to drive positive change. So at the moment, you can't get walkability in there, because there is no strategic or policy commitment to doing something like that. It's largely still driven by the car. Um, the next big thing that's sort of area there, and again we've got a lot more, but the one that I'm going to focus is our commitment to a car-based society <laughs> is deeply embedded in our culture, um, and particularly sort of around the values and beliefs that we have to our choice um, and freedom of movement and stuff like that. And that makes it very difficult to implement change that challenges the status of the car. You remove car access to the traders on a high street and you will know about it. <laughs> it's political there and, 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 and we're uh, uh, a local democratically elected sort of uh, council officers, uh, council laws, that and it makes decision making very difficult. So a lot of this is about behavioural change. We have to change our attitudes and our values if you're going to bring walkability in. So we realise that. Um, the other thing is, is that guidance. Um, a lot of our urban design guides and everything actually based around a car-based society. So if you're going to actually try and get walkability in there, you can't because in fact all of the standards and everything you're doing means that by the time you've finished it ends up looking like another car park lot. Um, so uh, all, all of this in one day. Uh, so we've got a whole lot of reasons why strategic comments, but the one I'm just going to focus on probably captures it all there, is the lack of strategic com commitment in many councils limits their ability to drive positive change. So at the moment, you can't get walkability in there because there is no strategic or policy commitment to doing something like that. It's largely still driven by the car. Um, the next big thing that's sort of area there, and again we've got a lot more, but the one I'm going to focus is our commitment to a car-based society <laughs> is deeply embedded in our culture. Um, and particularly it's sort of around the values and beliefs that we have to our choice um, and freedom of movement and stuff like that. And that makes it very difficult to implement change that challenges the status of the car. You remove car access to the traders on a high street and you will know about it. <laughs> political there and, 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 and we're a, a, a locally democratically elected sort of uh, council officers, uh, council, council laws there and it makes decision making very difficult. So a lot of this is about behavioural change. We have to change our attitudes and our values if you're going to bring walkability in. So we realise that. Um, the other thing is, is that guidance. Um, a lot of our urban design guides and everything actually based around a car-based society. So if you're going to actually try and get walkability in there, you can't because in fact all of the standards and everything you're doing means that by the time you've finished it ends up looking like another car park lot. Um, so we, we need, uh, uh, these are some of the things. So we, we, having noted all of those problems down, we sort of turn around and <laughs> say, um, where do we need to get to? What would it look like if we could solve this? And the, actually I really like quite well because they came down with some really quite sort of strong KPIs. More people walking 
and effectively, children would be walking to school. If we actually succeed in this, children will start walking to school. We won't have a queue of, in my suburb, we wouldn't have a queue of four-wheel drives that block the sort of the whole wheel there, and one child jumps out, <laughs> and the circle keeps going back. Uh, seniors would walk to shops. Uh, commuters would walk to public transport. Uh, citizens would walk to work. In fact, taxi would do a whole lot more walking, but we thought, this is where we've got to get to. But there's one real big problem. We don't know how much more walking we've got to achieve. Am I going to get 5% of the population to start walking? Is it 50%? If we're to solve some of these heart problems and, and all of this and the diabetes and the health issues and, and all of those others, how much do I need to get? How big a change? It's that easy for me to get a 1% change in, in walkability for my suburb. I can probably do that. But is it really worth that? Is that the change that you need to bring about? And so we, we're asking you as researchers, this is where we're coming back to. We need the evidence. We can't get, we can't make changes in, in, in council. We can't get people to abandon their car, park it 200 metres away, or to actually sort of cut a, a street down and actually remove it from being four lanes, 60 kilometres an hour, to being two lanes, 40 kilometres an hour, with three crossings in it. If I have no evidence that it's going to support that. So I'm absolutely dependent on you. And this is critical because it's, it's going to improve and change our walkability. Um, the other thing is we're going to build walkable suburbs. You go out to Melton, and Melton's a classic. We're building new suburbs that are totally unwalkable. They're built for the car. You can't get to the shops. You can't. It's just not designed around this. We need to change completely the whole notion of how we design. The other thing is, is that um, you know, there's a whole lot of other things about human-centric design, support for aging in place. We can't age in place in the new suburbs because as soon as you can't drive, you can't live there. Places for people, de destinations are walkable. So there's a whole, th these are the things that we, we've got to get to. Um, we need an internet connected network of paths uh, 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 there. We need to understand what our networks are like. And one of the things that we sort of thought, thought was a really good outcome is that there'd be a real, a strong network. You wouldn't get to somewhere and then suddenly find you've got to cross a six lane road that you can't get across. You wouldn't be sending your child to school and suddenly find that they've actually got to walk 200, km, 200 meters up the road there, cross over there, 200 meters back down here, they've got to walk 400 meters extra. You know a child won't do that. They'll cross the road, they'll take the risk, and you've let the child go to school. So unless we've got networks that work, um, and we need to. Um, so how are we going to get there? One thing that we sort of said, we need to improve the metro planning strategy. We need to get involved there. There's a whole con concept in there of a 20 minute Melbourne. We think that's brilliant, but I don't know whether it's strong enough on walkability. It's still car based. Um, it's 20 minutes with a car. It's not 20 minutes with walking. It's not change. It's not a paradigm shift. So we think we've got to get in and start introducing that. We certainly want to build on this principle for pedestrian networks, which is the stuff that you sort of start to see there on those networks. And we want to get that across every council. Uh, we need evidence if we're going to go in and start sort of affecting the sort of the uh, Melbourne <coughs> planning strategy. And we need data if we're going to actually start doing the PNP. Um, we actually also need to get it incorporated in, in our policy and the stuff that we do. We the strategic statements, council plans, municipal plans. It's a really good example, Pete First. They've actually put in Port Phillip, they've actually put walking as the top of the hierarchy. That is the primary mechanism for moving around Port Melbourne. And it's starting to change the whole game. Um, we'll know it when it really succeeds when the prioritisation of the investment also reflects the hierarchy that they've established. Um, at the moment it doesn't. Investment still goes towards the car. Um, we need to actually start changing our problem statement. At the moment it's all about access. But what about if it's about health and about livability? What if, what if our real problem is actually about the livability and the health of our community, not about whether I've got access? And do we change our problem statements? And do we change the way we sort of look at the car and and men to a corner from all of us? And how we do it? It's complex. Um, we, we needed to improve a, a rationale. One of the things, and again, I put this in blue or highlighted because that's the sort of stuff that's coming back from your researchers, the economic sort of benefits and that. Traders at the moment, if you go in there, you instinctively will turn around and sort of say, you take away the cars, you take away my business, you're killing me. You can't do it. Some studies have actually completely refuted that. So the Atkins Street study is a classic example where in fact they realise that in fact 
that most of their business came from people that walked. And in fact, if they supported that. So there are things there, but we need better evidence. And again, I'm coming back to you researchers. I need that sort of coming from there. Uh, change, change the new suburbs that are built. So start with schools and start with walkability at the start. Let you get those, those people walking before you build a car-based uh, <coughs> dependency. And change that. Design for children. Um, if we designed for children, and we did, started designing completely for children, we would start changing all of this. So in fact, actually, if you just designed for children, it would probably be the answer to most of this. Um, I know we're going, to be, we're, going to, we're going to design equally for everybody, but if you've got it right for children, it would probably be right for everybody else. And, and improve our understanding of the <coughs> Why don't people walk at the moment? We just don't know. So if you walk into, if you walk into council at the moment and you try and sort of get a walkability in your high street, you're going to be confronted with eight or nine councillors who all have a personal opinion, and you've no way of refuting any of that evidence. The law put whatever barriers they want, and we've got no evidence to suggest what the barriers are and where it, and where it really is. We just don't have that. Um, so what, these, what actions that came out of the, the workshop that we sort of said we want to build economic proof? We need to improve the data schemes. We, we recognize that. We're going to have work with you. We want to provide standard common schemas and stuff like that. We want linear referencing for the footpaths so that you don't get sort of to, to, the, to the crossing of a road and gaps in the footpath network. We actually have proper sort of there. We want identification of non-council non footpaths because we don't own all the footpaths. Um, we want the barriers along the paths where you can't cross, where you can't do those sort of things. Um, connection, connectivity to um, an amenity. Uh, as much about walking is actually not actually destination driven. We're, we're still, the stuff that's coming out of the Department of Transport is brilliant, but it's still based around destination. You walk because of a purpose for destination. What about if I walk because I can walk? I walk just because I, I'm able to. I walk and actually sit on the bench and I look at the sunset. It's, that's the livability side of it, and there's a whole other dimension, and we need to sort of start understanding that. Um, we need to understand footpath dimensions. We don't give you that. Again, you can, if you can't get a tram along that, if you can't actually walk with two children, one in either arm, you're not going to walk the children to school. If your footpath's not wide enough, if you can't do that, if you've actually got sort of cows coming uh, 100k right next to you and you've no barrier and you've only got a footpath of two metres wide, you're not going to walk the kids to school. So we need, you need to know in that research data, the tools, and I know those age based models, we, we're suggesting in, it will need to go a stage further. Uh, we need footpath classification schemas, we need land use and clue data. Clue data is absolutely critical to this. And we, again, the, the work that Christine's been doing with clue is, is just absolutely key, we believe. Um, we've said we'll set up a special interest group uh, for GIS to actually start looking at sort of getting a common set of standards and schema for you guys so that there's actually commonality across the sector to actually provide you with use of common data. And we would like to, like to set up um, common pedestrian surveys. Um, so that in fact actually you're actually getting kind of consistent data for that. Um, we'd actually also like to sort of see other things come in that was indicated in the age of modeling, so I don't need to go through those because they're almost overlapping what was said there. Um, so that's where we've got.